Where is that background? Gettysburg. Did you put it up yourself or is it like hanging on your wall? I put it up myself. Ah, see. I, I have no idea how I did it. <laughs> I couldn't get any of the backgrounds to work for me because they, it kept saying I didn't have the right video card or something and it looked like the screen, but you couldn't see my face, which is probably better, but still. Too much orange. Yeah. So I, I made him completely reconfigure one of the walls in the kitchen so that I could have my little coffee stuff behind me so everybody could see this is what my kitchen looks like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I figured out this morning, Benji had a, his confirmation class was done on Zoom. It is fantastic. I, so far, so good. This is the first show that I've done. So that's why mm -hmm. it was good because tomorrow morning, or not tomorrow morning, Tuesday morning, I'm doing a Zoom interview with Mark Merrill, the CEO of Valley Health. So this is going to be- your, I'm your guinea pig. Yes. Yeah, I'm your guinea pig. Yes. All right. So where you want to just get started? Let's just get into it. Are you videotaping this too or just? I am, it? but not, I probably won't use the videotape for anything. I just like the video because for me, it's easier to have a conversation when I can see people's faces. Well, most people's faces. <laughs> <laughs> right. So here's my plan. The plan is I'm going to go in tomorrow. I'm going to start the show live do the intro live like I normally do and tell people that I'm about to have a conversation with you that I recorded today. Then I'm going to play the conversation, go to break. And then the second half of the show is going to be Lonnie and he and I are going to talk about what we're doing internally at the station for getting news out, how we're pre-programming the access that people now have from their houses and all of the logistical stuff that we're trying to manage to keep traffic at the station to a minimum. Okay. So Wait, what, about 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Yeah, 10, 12 minutes typically. And I really only have two or three questions for you. One of them is just your, what safeguards have you put in place for us? Because okay. you've said, you know, limit the number of people at the station. Um, while nobody ever likes to see or live through a crisis, you have long since said that local radio is at its best in a crisis. Why do you right. say that? And okay. then the last one is, what advice do you have for businesses and our community as a whole to help us come out of this on the other side stronger and better? Okay. All right. Yeah. So, Andrew, thank you for taking some time on a Sunday afternoon to have a conversation with me. Oh, my pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity to, to kind of talk with you, but also talk with the folks in the northern Shenandoah Valley. So I'm going to start with first asking, how are you doing? How, how are things with you in Delaware? Uh, Delaware's fine. I'm fine. Uh, uh, you know, we're all kind of in that shelter in place mode. Uh, the East Coast seems to be very hard hit because of the, the, the fact that population centers were so densely populated here between Boston and all the way down to Richmond. Um, and so it's probably a little bit more prevalent on the East Coast at this point in time. But, you know, and Delaware's right in that corridor. So we're, we're making sure that we take the proper precautions, uh, not just from a community standpoint, but also from a family standpoint. You know, we're we're at home. It'll be a, a test tomorrow of our um, Wi-Fi capabilities because I have two children who'll be taking classes online. My wife is working from home and I'll be working from home. So we'll just see how good Wi-Fi is here in Delaware. Now, I hope everybody at least has their own device so you're not going to be fighting over screens. Uh, we all have our own devices and I'm trying to figure out how to put background screen uh, pictures up for the rest of the kids so they can do their, <laughs> their classes. My daughter was actually told for her classes that she must be school appropriately attired, meaning no pajamas. Oh, see, so yeah, clearly radio is uh, a good place to be because I am literally in my pajamas right now. <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about, you're, you're the owner, president, CEO of Royal Broadcasting, which is the parent company of sorts for the River 95.3 and Sports Radio 1450. When all of this started, what are some of the safeguards that you put in place to make sure that all of us as staff were going to be safe and be able to carry on through this crisis? Well, I, I will tell you, step one happened actually before this crisis became a crisis. Um, any business owner, anybody who's involved in operations of, of any type, will know that proper planning before something bad happens is necessary. So the idea of what would you do in a crisis needs to be at the forefront. You know, for example, take that, you know, the, the scenario of a home fire. You've got people in the house where, you know, how are supposed to, people supposed to evacuate? How are they supposed to contact each other? What are they supposed to do when they're out of the house? Uh, and so 
anybody who knows anything about emergency uh, disasters and management of those knows that there's got to be some kind of idea. But this is something that beyond which a normal planning would you have any concept of what to do um, because it is so widespread and affects every facet of, of our lives um, from going to work and school to to food um, to uh, the economy. I mean, it's going to be not just a three month deal, but this could be 13 months or beyond in terms of the impact of this. So how are we as a radio station staff going to continue to take care of ourselves the, the, the personal side of an, an emergency, you don't run back into a house that's on fire after you've left the house. I mean, that's rule number one. Get yourself out, don't go back in. Um, and so how are we going to uh, manage the, the emergency on our end? And so a couple of things that we talked very early on uh, from a staff where I said, I don't want any more than two people in the building at any one time. Um, again, trying to minimize the impact of, of each other uh, around each other because we all have if you think about it, if you talk to two people, they've talked to two people, they've talked to two people. So exponentially, um, trying to minimize, if not eliminate as much as possible, that contact with others. Um, number two is, is every day I want everybody to kind of scrub down, wipe down, uh, antimicrobial down, all of the things that we normally touch, doorknobs, phones, the production boards, um, in the bathrooms, et cetera. And so just, you know, some, some quick sanitizing, Lysol spraying, that type of thing. Uh, number three, I, I, I hate to say this, but we're not giving away prizes. We're not allowing people to come to the station. We want, again, the shelter in place. Um, people from the community should not be out and about. They certainly shouldn't be stopping by the local radio station. So uh, we want to eliminate people coming to the building without purpose. Um, and by purposeful, you know, it, it's got to be something to do with our programming or the emergency um, response that we're providing. Um, most importantly is making sure that our lines of communication with each other and the audience are not only in place, but kind of hyper serving at this point in time. Um, we want to maintain a normal sense of feeling and, 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 and business operation, but we also want to maintain that line of communication so that people don't feel isolated, that they have an idea of what's going on. So the idea was for the, for the group of us, for the staff to say, how are we going to provide this information? What are we going to provide? How are we going to provide it? And in what manner are we going to provide it? And so I think over the last couple of weeks, I think we've done a very good job of making sure that what we, what we disseminate is accurate, truthful, meaningful information. It's not hype. It's not hyperbole. It's not something that, that you know, shocks the system. It's the facts and it's the information people in the Northern Valley need to know. Nobody ever wants to have to live or work their way through a crisis of any kind, whether it's a natural disaster from a tornado or a flood or something along those lines, or in this case, a health crisis. But you have long said that in a crisis, that is the opportunity for local radio to shine. What do you mean by that? I lived, in 1979, I lived 10.1 miles away from Three Mile Island. Uh, and I recall vividly one of my first experiences with radio and communication was the lack of information that the media had because that line of communication um, wasn't there. It, was, it wasn't in place. And so I think radio has gotten better um, because of emergencies. We, we, we kind of learn what we did wrong, but we kind of implement from the last time what we know to do right. Um, and radio, the, the beauty of radio is that you don't need face-to-face -face communication with somebody to get the information. You don't need prep time. You don't need, there's an immediacy to what we do. Um, you don't need to worry about the cameras. You don't need to worry about the ink. Um, those, those types of media all have their place and purpose. But when it comes to radio, we're, we're the, I hate to say that, we're, we're better than social media because we, we are the people who you have entrusted to find factual, truthful information. You don't need to go to Snopes with the radio station. You know that when you we've passed something along to you, that information has been vetted out through the authorities that have given it to us to pass it along to you. And I, and I would hope that through my 20 years at the, in the Valley and my 35 plus years in radio, that people have trusted um, the words that come out of my mouth and the words that come out of the mouth of people that work with me. A lot of what I'm hearing from some of the local businesses that I've been talking to the last couple of weeks is their ability now to pivot. And I think... We 
did do a good job of making the pivot, but it really wasn't that hard for us because we were already doing a lot of those things anyway. Now we're just doing them on a more often basis or more frequently. Absolutely. And I, I will say that mo there are 15,000 radio stations in America. Most of them had the ability to pivot. Some of them, it took a little longer because they weren't set up the way we were set up. But we've always been set up to be a community servant. Um, but every radio station has the ability and the opportunity to pivot pretty quickly to be able to provide that meaningful local information that people need. Um, if, if you read my letter a couple weeks ago, I, I wasn't poking fun of the people in Idaho um, when I wrote that, but people in Idaho have their own unique issues to deal with in, in, a, in a national emergency. It's much different from the Northern Shenandoah Valley. And so radio stations in Idaho have to deal with a completely different set of criteria than the people in the Northern Shenandoah Valley have to deal with. We had our staff meeting via Zoom last week. And one of the things that you wanted to make sure was clear to all of us is given what's going on from an economic perspective, all of us are safe in our jobs. And I'm sure that's a big deal for a lot of these other small businesses out there that are really struggling to be able to keep their employees on and to pay their employees if they aren't open or able to utilize their services anymore on a full-time basis. Do you have any advice for some of those business owners? I, I, I wish I, it is a case by case um, a thing with a lot of businesses, restaurants, service industries, um, businesses that are considered to be essential versus those that are, uh, are, are not essential. Um, the, the, the best advice I can give is to be patient and thoughtful. Um, this, is, this is a shared sacrifice. There are 330 million people who are dealing with the same issue. Um, and, and so it's, I'm able to be as a, as a small business owner, as, as a small operator, to kind of look you all in the eye and say, this is what we're going to be able to do collectively. Um, the best thing that a, a business owner or manager can do is be truthful and honest with their employees and, and what the pot, potential outcome is going to be. And also ask their community for help. Um, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a crime to say, hey, you know what? I, I may have to shut my doors if a small, you know, small business doesn't get some kind of relief, whether it's from the government or whether it's from the people in the community. I've, I've seen an interesting meme floating around that says, remember the people that you asked, used to ask to donate to your um, food drive or, or nonprofit right event, et cetera, make sure that you're remembering them and supporting them in that time of need. Um, I know we're all talking about, you know, direct mail ordering and going to Amazon and eBay and all those things. Remember the guy or girl down the street who's got the storefront that's open um, because that's the engine of small, small business um, and the economy of this country. In, in three months, when the doors start to open up a little bit more and we're able to get back out, we need to not just patronize them, but hyper patronize those people. So business owners, if they can weather the storm to some extent over the next few months, and some, some businesses just aren't going to be able to do that. Um, and, and I think there, are, there are, should be things in place to kind of help them at least get back up on their feet. Uh, but patience is probably the number one and honesty is number two. What about for the community as a whole? I mean, do you have any advice or suggestions for Joe Smith, our neighbor that lives just down the street? Yeah, whether you believe this is hype or you are thinking that this is the end of the world, you got to remember that this is still the reality. Um, you, you can't ignore it. You can't say that this doesn't matter. You can't say that I'm going to go to a party with 50 people. Um, like I guess it doesn't matter if you believe that this is, this is overblown or you believe that this is the, the end of time. Um, we all have to deal with the same reality right now. And so I'll, I'll say the same thing to Joe Smith down the street. Patience and, and honesty. Those are the two things. And, and pay attention to your neighbor because the reality of it is that there's a neighbor to your left or the right who is in more dire need than you are. So if we can kind of hold each other up and say, what can I get for you? I, I went out earlier today. I, I had to make a store run um, to pick up some things, frozen pizza. Um, <laughs> and so before I walked out the door, my, my wife called members of the family, and he's going out, what do you need? Um, and so that's the kind of thing, just little things like that to make sure that your neighbors know that you're there to have a helping hand. Um, is probably the number one thing you can do as long as you're maintaining that, that sense of safeness and security that you need and your family needs. 
I've been joking. I saw it on the Today Show a few weeks ago, and then I mentioned this in one of my conversations last week with Dr. Green from the Lord Fairfax Health District, that I think one of the th ways that we took a wrong turn with all of this descriptive stuff is in using the phrase social distancing, because I think right now we need to be more socially close than we've probably ever been before, and that the phrase should be physical distancing, because we can't stand as close to each other as we used to, but we should certainly be more in contact and more social with each other than we've ever been. A number of years ago, I got an opportunity to visit Alaska. Boy, that's looking really good right now. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're, you're absolutely right. Social distancing, you know, social media is, is finally finding its footing uh, when it comes to making sure that we are connected. I'm seeing all these challenges about post your favorite beach picture, and, you know, I know um, see a pup, post a pup, that kind of stuff things that kind of give us a little sense of security and community um, when we're not allowed to have face-to-face -face time. Uh, but you're right. Physical distancing is very important. I had a guy yell at me the other day. I was, I was coming back from a run. He was coming by the other way on his bike. There was a car coming up behind him. He didn't realize it. And I just, I, I was trying to get out of his way, but he was in my way. Um, and I said, car behind. And he yelled, six feet, six feet. Um, <laughs> And I'm like, all right, I guess I could have let the car hit you, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, so yeah, that, that being conscious of not what you need, but what somebody else might need is probably the most important thing we can do from a, from a physical distancing standpoint. Um, we're all at some spectrum of, of susceptibility to this. Some of us have a higher immunity than others, um, but we all still need to make sure that we're able to take care of ourselves so that we are able to take care of others. Well, Andrew, thank you for taking some time out on a Sunday afternoon to have a conversation with me. Hey, my pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to the Valley. Um, I, I look forward to coming back down uh, when I'm allowed in the state. <laughs> um, <laughs> who knows when that will be? Um, but I, I, I'm doing what I've just suggested everybody else is I'm taking care of myself because when the oxygen mask drops in the airplane, the first person you take care of is yourself. Um, and I can't take care of anybody else in my, in my universe if I'm not taking care of myself first. And that's great advice to have. Before we wrap up, is there any uh, wonderful, nice things you want to say about how awesome I am and what a great job I'm doing before I turn off your microphone? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, nice. <laughs> I, I, I will say this. I'm, I'm very proud, very pleased of the folks. And I've said this before. I, I've been there for almost 20 years. Um, the, the staff at the River and the Sports Radio – we truly do believe in what we do. Um, everybody at that station has always said community service, being part of the community and being a servant is number one. Um, and so to that end, we're going to do the best we can do uh, to make sure that we are pro providing information that's, that's relevant, significant, timely, meaningful, factual, um, in, an, in a manner that doesn't incite people to go nuts. Um, and, 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 you, Janet, Randy, Lonnie, Alyssa, um, the, the support crew, Liz behind the scenes, Phil, Kathy, uh, Mike and Kemp. Um, what's the new guy's name? Jacob. <laughs> Jacob. I almost said Jordan. I said Jacob. Um, you, you've done a fabulous job above and beyond. There's no way I can thank you for what you've done. Um, because you, to do this, you do increase your risk a little bit um, of being involved and being out there. So, so knowing that, um, we're not, we're not first responders. We're not nurses and doctors and things, but we are part of that communication chain. Uh, and so to that end, I can't thank the staff enough and I can't thank the community enough for supporting what we do. Well, thank you for talking to me today. I'm going to talk to Lonnie now. Bye. Hi, Lonnie. <laughs> and so concludes our recorded portion of the radio show. <laughs> that work? Anything else you need to tell me or I need to do or you need me to do for you? Nope, we're all good at the moment. Yeah, at the moment. There's the key the, phrase. Yeah, well, <laughs> all right, hour dear. by hour. Yep. Thank you. I'll, I'll check in with you later. All righty. Bye.